that's not fit so well uh, is at a lower part of the of the hill and has a particular uh, has particular DNA and maybe by a mutation it can get higher on the hill and higher and higher till it reaches the zenith. And uh, that's kind of a popular view of evolution. You know, mutation comes along, the organism gets better. Another one comes along, gets even better until it's great. Uh, but now that we know the complexity of life, this simple, uh, almost cartoonish conception is really inadequate. As many people have talked about, many scientists have talked about, a more realistic evolutionary landscape would be quite rugged where you could change one component, one nut or bolt of a molecular machine, that might help a little bit, but then to help something else, maybe you could change some other completely different component. Now the important point about this is that in, in a situation like this, there's a direction to evolution. It can go up, it goes up until it gets hit the best it can be. But if you're an organism that's on this peak of a rugged landscape, there's no direction. You could go this way or that way or the other way. You could change a nut or a bolt or a lever or something, but you're not really accumulating uh, something uh, beneficial. Uh, and the <coughs> landscape, the uh, such a landscape, is what I call incoherent. It's substantially incoherent. That means, again, there's no particular a change in one uh, a change in one feature. Uh, is not necessarily correlated with another a change in a, another feature that's going to help the organism. There's no net benefit in any particular machine, single machine. And scientists uh, have been recognizing this. There have been a number of books in the past 10 years written by people of good reputation, not like me, who challenge uh, Darwin's theory and say it's not adequate to explain what we knew, know about biology. One guy uh, named Richard Watson, an Englishman, uh, wrote a book called Compositional Evolution uh, last year. He's a computer scientist interested in uh, evolutionary computation. And he says in computer science we recognize that the algorithmic principle described by Darwin uh, as hill climbing, more specifically random hill, uh, mutation hill climbing. However, we also recognize that hill climbing is the simplest possible form of optimization and is known to work well only on a limited class of problems, kind of like on antibiotic resistance and some things I'll talk about in a, in a few minutes. So, uh, uh, so things have changed for Darwin. Life is a whole lot more complex. We recognize that his idea, although it works on some things, doesn't work on much. Uh, and so there are good reasons to think that Darwin's theory is limited. Nonetheless, um, a lot of scientists, as, as you may know, uh, think that Darwin's theory is, is, an, is the explanation for all of life. For example, Richard Dawkins, who's been in the news this past year or so on, on more philosophical topics, um, wrote in 1986 that he says, we have seen that living things are too improbable and too beautifully designed to have come into existence by chance. How then did they come into existence? By gradual step-by-step -step transformations from simple beginnings kind of like the simple hill, the simple evolutionary landscape that I, I showed you. So he doesn't let these things, these little technicalities, uh, these little complexities of life bother him. He says that you know, no matter what, uh, we think that Darwin's theory can, can, uh, can explain everything. Uh, so it's kind of like this, the situation is, uh, and this is just a cartoon I, I got off uh, the internet, you know, we've got a fellow here stranded on an island and he's thinking to himself, well, I'll just write uh, a note in a bottle and I'll, I'll throw it out into the ocean and, and certainly, you know, I'll find, you know, somebody will come to rescue me and it will probably be somebody uh, like that. Uh, and yet if you sit down and calculate coldly what are, what's the likelihood of that happen, happening, uh, the odds are against it. Uh, so things have boiled down, especially since Darwin's Black Box was published 10 years ago, to a group of people like uh, intelligent design proponents and, and even other folks like Richard Watson saying Darwin's theory don't, doesn't work. Other people saying yes it does. Other people saying no, yes, no, yes. So it's kind of stalemated, you know, yes, you know, uh, says, says so, says not, says so, says not. So what we need is evidence. And that's what 
the edge of evolution focuses on. It asks the question, okay, well, leave aside our imaginations, what we want, what's, what's the evidence show that Darwin, Darwinian processes do? Uh, and uh, in my book, I talk about uh, the fact that the best evidence to assess the ability of Darwinian processes comes from studies of malaria, uh, because malaria has, has plagued the human race for a long time, and in this genomic era, 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 we have been able to track down genetic changes in the human genome, which has given people uh, a, a portion of a defense against malaria. Additionally, in recent years, just the past five years or so, we've also been able to track down genetic changes in malaria as it developed resistance against drugs that we use to treat people. And it turns out because, <coughs> because of our detailed genetic studies of this evolutionary conflict between us and the mal a malarial uh, parasite, and because of something I'll talk about later, just the sheer number of parasites uh, that infest humanity from malaria. Uh, this is the best evidence for what Darwinian processes can do. So let's start with a little overview of this. You know, I know it's, this is a little more technical and a little more uh, outside of what's normally discussed uh, uh, in evolution, so, so bear with me. I, I think the result will be uh, rewarding. So uh, when somebody uh, uh, is bitten by a malaria-infected mosquito, the malaria parasite, which is a single-celled creature, uh, gets into your body, goes to your liver, hangs out there a little while, reproduces until it makes thousands of, of uh, kind of preliminary cells, which go and invade red blood cells. See, they attach themselves to a red blood cell, they go inside, and they eat the hemoglobin. They eat the insides of the red blood cell. And once they have done that, they multiply to about 20 and they burst out of the red blood cell and each of the 20 goes and attaches itself to a new red blood cell where the process reproduces. So they eat your blood. And a person who dies from malaria frequently dies uh, from lack of blood. Uh, like little you know, vampires, they, they eat, uh, they drink our blood. <clears throat> and uh, uh, every, uh, a lot of people here have probably seen something like this. This is a map of where malaria is in the world in blue and also where people that have a certain genetic mutation live. And the mutation is for the sickle cell gene. And you notice that it, there's a large overlap between where people with sickle cell genes live and where malaria occurs, and that's because this, cha this change, uh, this genetic change, confers resistance to malaria. And this has been hail, it's, this, is, this particular figure, or something like it, occurs in, in many biology texts, and it's, a, a, it's always uh, put forward as a prime example of, of Darwinian evolution. And it is a prime example of, of Darwinian evolution. <laughs> um, so, uh, but to understand why it shows tiny changes, you know, kind of like scratches on a car, tiny changes in a pre-existing system, and why it, in fact, shows the limits of Darwinism much more than its possibilities, I'm going to, I'm afraid, give you a little bit of details about what's going on exactly at the molecular level um, in this, uh, in this example of Darwinian evolution. And I emphasize in the book that you, you know, uh, you really have to, if you're going to really rigorously evaluate Darwin's theory, you have to look at where it's acting. And much of the action, although we can't see it, much of the action takes place in the DNA and proteins at the molecular level of life. So inside your red blood cells is hemoglobin. That's a molecule, a protein that transports oxygen from your lungs to your fingers and toes and, and everything else. And this is just kind of a schematic drawing of hemoglobin showing uh, these sausage-like things which are uh, things called, uh, which are chains of, of amino acids uh, together. And that's one representation. Here's a second, oh, I'm sorry, um, just, to, just for scale, you remember that uh, magnificent complex psyllium that I showed you before uh, in the journal Nanotechnology. 
this whole hemoglobin molecule would be one of the blue dots in that structure. So although this looks complex here, uh, it is dwarfed by the complexity of other things. And, and this is essentially just one, you know, a nut or a bolt uh, in, a, in a larger system. <clears throat> now we can draw the hemoglobin molecule in another form, and I don't mean to tax you again, but, uh, but I think this is the best way to get the idea across. This is just kind of a, a writing down the one letter abbreviations of the amino acids in the, in the uh, chains of hemoglobin. There are 140 in two different chains of hemoglobin. In, sickle cell, in the sickle cell gene, the mutation that gives resistance to malaria that allows thousands and thousands of people to live who otherwise would die from malaria, one thing has changed. The amino acid at position number six right here has been changed from an E to a V. And that's it, okay? Just that tiny, tiny change. Remember, this is just one tiny part, uh, and the psyllium contains hundreds of, of, of uh, molecules like hemoglobin. This is only one part of a tiny part of a protein. Okay, so this one change allows the hemoglobin uh, to confer resistance to malaria. How does that do that? It turns out that the, when the V, the E is changed to a V, it's like putting a wad of chewing gum on part of the hemoglobin. Makes it sticky. That allows it to stick to another molecule of hemoglobin in the red blood cell. Turns out there are hundreds of millions of copies of the hemoglobin in the red blood cell, so they all stick to each other and they form a solid. They essentially precipitate. It's kind of like boiling jello, and when you cool it down, it congeals. Well, here the hemoglobin is congealing within the red blood cell. And here's an electron micrograph, a, a powerful microscopic picture. You see these sickle cell fibers. They're forming inside a red blood cell, where normally it's a nice liquid, s liquid solution. Now it's like a bag of cement. It's congealed. Here's a microscope picture of normal cells. Here are sickled cells. You see the cell has been severely distorted by, by this process. Now this is good when a person has one copy of the sickle gene and a malarial parasite goes in a normal red blood cell and it causes it to, to change shape to the sickled form because then the spleen of the person recognizes this as distorted, grabs the cell, destroys it along with the malarial parasite inside. Unfortunately, <clears throat> some people inherit two copies of the sickle cell gene, one from their mom, one from their dad. And it turns out that when you have two copies of the sickle cell gene, <clears throat> you don't need a malarial parasite entering your red blood cell to push it into the sickle form. It will go into the sickle form every time the red blood cell dumps off its oxygen at, in the periphery uh, and enters your veins. And that can cause the cells to get stuck in the capillary, jam things up, and, and uh, cause severe problems. And sickle cell disease uh, kills many, many people worldwide each year. So the point is that <clears throat> this paradigmatic example of Darwinian evolution is a tiny change in a, tiny, in a pre existing part of a system uh, which causes severe collateral damage. Well, okay, that's, that's one example. But there are many different types of DNA mutations. The, the one that changed in sickle cell disease was called a substitution, where you switch that E for a V, one kind of uh, nucleotide for another. There's actually an amino acid in the, uh, in the protein. But you can have mutations that are deletions, where you omit some nucleotides or, or other things, insertions, inversions, and, and many other types. And it turns out that some of them have cropped up in the human genome in places that also confer some resistance to malaria. And here's a table showing uh, the by far the most prominent ones. Here's the sickle cell mutation. That leads to sickle cell disease. Another mutation that confers some resistance to malaria is called alpha thalassemia, in which one gene for one of the chains of hemoglobin is deleted, thrown out. 
and it turns and that leads to anemia and it, of course it breaks the gene 